Hi, everyone. So we're going to spend the next um, hour or so talking about resume building. Um, this is certainly near and dear to my heart as an HR professional. I do lots and lots of resume reviewing and also as a coach, do lots of resume editing and resume um, question and answer. So I love this topic. I could talk for hours on this topic. So um, the structure of today's um, uh, session will be basically in four parts. So we're going to focus on formatting your resume, on writing effective cover letters, on optimizing your resume for technology. So for artificial intelligence and those applicant tracking systems that um, most of the time are the thing that are looking at our resumes first. And then some resume do's and don'ts from, from recruiters. So from people within my network, as well as myself. So we're splitting this into four sections. Um, what I tend to do as we go along is to ask um, if anyone has questions, we'll do that at the end of each section or at the end of each slide um, so that people have an opportunity to ask questions while while they're fresh in your head. So to start out, we all know um, through research and even just through our own experience that really recruiters only spend, you know, six to 10 seconds on a resume when they first screen it. If you even get a human, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you're going through an applicant tracking system. So really it's a system or an algorithm um, that is screening your resume. So it's not actually a person. So in that case, it's, you know, it's milliseconds. It's really just screening for key, um, keywords and so forth. So in order to make sure that your resume is as visually appealing as, as possible in the event that it's a person that's looking at it, or that it is optimized for technology mm -hmm. so that if you're um, applying through an applicant tracking system that you have the best possible chance of being screened in for a position that you're applying to, um, I have some tips for you. So in terms of formatting, having a properly formatted resume is extremely important and one that is um, visually appealing. So just to start out, there's three elements on this slide and this is just, this is from my own. Um, that I would focus on here. So this is generally the, the first piece of your resume. When it comes to photos, photos used to be considered something that was not, um, not desired to be put on a resume. That has changed with social media. So social media sites like LinkedIn, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, they encourage that you have a photo on your, on your profile. So because of that, it's become a lot more commonplace to put a photo on a resume, because most of the time, if you're applying to something with your resume, you have your LinkedIn, um, your, your uh, link to your LinkedIn page right on your resume. So people are going to see what you look like if you have your photo on your LinkedIn profile. So there's no harm in putting it on your resume if you wish. I will say this is very personal in terms of it being a choice. You don't have to. It's kind of a nice thing to do. So if you do choose to put a photo on your resume, a couple tips. Keep it small, so maybe two by two inches. Put it up in the top left or top right corner. It shouldn't take up too much real estate because you really do want to leave lots of room for you to put um, really the meat of your resume, all the, you know, the good stuff and the things that you want the recruiter to see. So don't take up a whole lot of space with your picture, but maybe two by two top left is great. Make sure it's just head and shoulders. You don't want full length shots. It's just, it's not as appropriate for a resume. And also um, make it professional in appearance. So it doesn't have to be a professionally taken picture, but make sure that it's presenting the image that you would like to project. In my case, I was wearing a suit because my job is one that where you would wear a suit. If what you're applying to is not that type of job, then wear whatever is comfortable. So whatever's in your picture should really represent you and the type of role that you're applying to. So also in, um, on this first section, this top section of your resume, you would normally put a profile section. So you can see that on the, the sort of bottom left of the slide. In your profile, what you want it to list are four or five key points that you want the recruiter or the hiring manager to note um, that directly relate to the role that you're applying to. So, you know, in my case, I've put things like, you know, 20 years experience in HR. I have training in mediation and, and dispute resolution, things like that. Um, so really be specific about the four or five key things that you really want that hiring manager to know. Pull them from the job posting. Make sure that you're emphasizing the things that are important to, um, to the company that's posted the position. And also make sure that they really um, speak to what your value is and what you would be bringing to this role so that it's you know, clearly understood in just a small little snippet. 
So this profile, along with your picture on the first piece is really, this is the thing that should be grabbing that recruiter's attention. If you're only getting, you know, a small amount of that person's time, this is really what you want them to see. So make good use of those four or five points. The next section on this slide, um, if you'll notice before we flip to the next one, is that little section on the right that is in blue font. So this is what I use as um, sort of a, a, a bio or a professional um, pitch, if you will. Um, it's a little different than the profile section. The profile section is very specific facts about me. This little bio section is really sort of a commentary on, you know, what is it about me that, again, I would like them to know in a small little snippet. So in terms of building your bio, so building this little blue section here, if you choose to put it on your resume, there's four ingredients to that. If you're building this little sales pitch on yourself or this little bio, these are the four things that you want to, to include in that. So I've put in brackets what my answers are, but you would put in brackets what yours are and then piece it together and there's your bio. So it starts out with what you do. So in my case, I'm an HR professional. You would put in there whatever your chosen field is. Your experience in doing it. So in my case, um, I have 20 years experience in various industries, companies as small as 60, as large as 78,000. You would put in there what your experience is in just a really brief statement. The next two are where you need to do a little bit of soul searching and a little bit of, of deep thought. So why do you do what you do? So in brackets, I've put why I do what I do. So I enjoy driving employee success and supporting companies and achieving their goals through HR programs and initiatives. So that's my personal why I do what I do. But you need to really think about why do I do whatever it is that my chosen career is and put that in there. And then what do you believe or what do you know about what you do? So in my case, my answer is I believe that when partnered with effective business leaders, HR professionals play a key role in shaping company culture, employee engagement and management effectiveness. So that took a little bit to get that right, that statement right. But if you, if you brainstorm and you jot down your notes and you jot down your thoughts around those last two, you'll be able to come up with something that's really true to you. And what I would suggest is that when you do have that little pitch and that bio, you put it on the front page of your resume where that little blue section was on mine. What's the difference between, like, and I know you mentioned before, but is that crucial to have both profile and bio on the resume? No. Okay. No, it's not necessary that you have both. And it really depends upon the, um, the type of role that you're, that you're applying to. In my case, um, I like to have both on mine simply because it's a bit of a snapshot. So that top piece, if all I'm getting is a few seconds of someone's time between mm -hmm. the, the bio and the little profile, those little few points, I feel like I've either, I'm going to get screened in or screened out, probably based on just those two sections. Mm -hmm. So I try to have both because what I would say is the, the, um, the four or five points in your profile, mm -hmm. that little piece on the left mm -hmm. are very factual. So those are facts about you. Okay. The sales pitch is a little more of a, here's why you want to know who I am. And here's why you want me to come into mm -hmm. your organization. So slightly different purpose. Okay. Can I put all under summary? Like you could um, yeah yeah okay yeah okay. the next section is on formatting so you've probably heard of doing resumes in two different ways there is chronological which is normally reverse chronological because you go from the most recent backwards or uh, functional resumes so functional was something that came kind of into trend several years ago we still sometimes see it. It's useful sometimes, but there's definitely preferences around how you how you set up your resume. So if we look at chronological first, so reverse or reverse chronological, basically what we're looking at here is, and this is the most the most common, most typical way of setting up a resume. When you look at your experience section, you would list the company that you work for currently and then go backwards. And a clean looking um, experience section like the one that I'm showing here is best if you can. Um, you'll notice that it has very clearly what was your title, when were you there, what's the company name, one little line around what the company does, just because I may not know and that might be an important piece of information for the HR person or the hiring manager, and then a few points about your job. 
So normally in a reverse chronological, you would, you would do it this way. So you would set it up in this fashion. You would normally only go back in your experience section about 10 to 15 years. You don't have to list in great detail anything beyond that, particularly if the skills that you used prior to that can be reflected in more recent roles. The exception to this is if you were at a position for 20 years, for example, of course you would list all of that because you were at the same organization. But you really, you wanna focus on the most recent um, experience that you've had most. So if you want to put just the title and the date for anything beyond 10 to 15 years, I would do that. I wouldn't put this level of detail into anything that is much older than that. So that's the way that a chronological would look. And this is again, the most common version of a resume. If we flip to the next one, this is a functional resume. I will be honest and say that HR people don't love this setup, but it, it does have a purpose. So if you are an individual who is looking to change career focus and is looking to go into a very different field or a very different role than the ones that you have had in the past, this might be a better format for you. In a functional setup, as you can see, you're really, you're, you are grouping your pieces of experience, your skills and your expertise, you're grouping it by skill set and by competency. You're not grouping it by job. So if you look at the top, this particular example lists the marketing experience that a person has, the sales training experience that the person has, the communications experience that they have, but it's doing so in one section rather than by job by individual job. So this would really work well if you were moving from one type of field to another field where you know that you have lots of transferable skills, you know that the, the tasks that you've done in previous roles would actually be very applicable to the new field that you wanna get into, but your job title might not seem as relevant it might not look to a recruiter or a hiring manager like you are the right type of candidate, but really if you know you have some skills and expertise that are transferable, this might be a better way to present yourself. You'll notice that work history is still here. So you're still listing your experience by title and by company and by date, but it's one line for each of those things. It's not bullet points beneath them that talk about each of those experiences because all of those bullet points are in the top section arranged by competency or skill set. Yes, I have a question. Yes, absolutely. I just want to know, are, is it um, advisable to do a combination of both the functional type formatting and the other one? It would depend what that looks like. I think I would need to see what that would look like um, in order to know whether it would be confusing to the hiring manager or the HR person. I mean, the strong preference for, for most people who are reading resumes is to just do chronological, is just, you know, list from the most recent backwards. Um, if you wanted to try and incorporate this sort of functional um, sort of feel, you might want to do it in a, in a different section. You might even want to use some of that profile space or that little sales pitch bio space to do this. If okay, because I'm just... I'm just looking at the technical proficiencies because mm -hmm. I, I tend to do to have that and, and just to list like, um, you know, my um, background in, in, in that area. And also I, I'm coming from a legal field. Yeah. So I also would list like my um, legal knowledge, like pertaining to the different like laws mm -hmm. and, and policies and bylaws. Yeah. and separate and then I, then I'll go into my work history and do it in chronological. Yeah, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think you really need to be highlighting exactly what you think that hiring manager or HR person needs to see. Oh, okay. So if it's if it is of utmost importance that they see your technical proficiencies and your background, your legal background, yes. then make sure that that is highlighted. Absolutely. Okay. Really okay. your resume, you know, as much as we we kind of like to see them you know, kind of look all the same because it's easier for the person that's reading it. What you really want to focus on is because you have so little time of, you know, of that person's time uh -huh. to really make sure that they're seeing what they want to see. However, you can highlight that 
do it. And, and the earlier in your resume, the better. So the higher on the first page, right. And definitely on the first page, right. Definitely. That is where you want to put it. So if, if for you, that's the most important piece, put it front and center so that that person that's reading it can see it. I mean, I know that, you know, when we say, you know, six seconds, if it's a person reading it, it sounds, it sounds like that is just such a little tiny amount of time. And we can't imagine that it would only be that amount of time that we're getting. But if the person has, you know, 50 resumes to go through, they are skimming. They're really, really skimming, right. You know, to catch like, where are those keywords? Where are those key job titles? You know, what do I need to see? And that person knows what they need to see. And if they don't see it quickly, you'll hit them, you know, you might hit the maybe pile as opposed to the no pile. You just might hit the maybe pile and they'll go back to it later, but you want to be in the yes pile. So, you know, okay. you want to make sure that those words and those phrases that you think they're looking for are front and center for them to see. This is really critical. How you describe your roles and how you describe your experience is so important. And this is an area that, that maybe doesn't get enough attention when we're doing our resumes. And I am absolutely guilty of this myself, even as someone that's been in HR for ever and ever um, and should know how to do this. Um, I actually had someone give me resume advice um, a few years ago when I was looking to change roles. And, you know, here I was thinking that I've done this and I should have a resume that doesn't need to have a whole lot of advice given to me. And sure enough, I was actually doing this particular thing wrong. So this is why I put this in here. When you're describing your roles and your experience and the, the tasks that you've done, you really need to be very specific in telling the reader why it's important that they know that little thing about you. So it's not only about listing the tasks, it's about listing why they were important and impactful and why they contributed to the company's success. So when I had the individual read over my resume, his feedback to me was at the end of every single one of your bullet points, I want you to ask the question, so what? And I mean, he was very blunt, but you know, that's, I looked at it from that perspective and looked back at my resume and said, well, I haven't answered that. I haven't answered that in, in most of the bullet points on my own resume. I haven't listed why the reader cares why I did that task. So when I'm giving people advice on resume writing and when I'm editing people's resumes, I certainly now look at that to say, okay, have I told the reader why it's important and what that thing is that I did how that contributed to the overall success of the company or the department or my coworkers or something. So why is it important? So when you're looking at describing your roles, make sure you're using action words. So, and there's some examples here, you drafted and you designed something, you updated and you maintained something, you improved something, you mentored a person, you established some kind of process. So make sure you're using action words to describe the things that you did in each of your roles. And then importantly, and you'll see it at the end of of, um, some of these points, say why it was important. So did it result in an increase in sales? by a particular percentage? Did it ensure more efficiency? So access to records, for example, did it improve a process of tracking? You know, for example, I think I used the example of improved spending reports and enhance the company's expenses and tracking of overall costs. So what did it do for the organization that was important? And I think this is something that's very easy to miss because what what we tend to do, and again, I've done this myself, what we tend to do is we take our job description and we paste it into our resume. But our job description simply lists our tasks. Our resume should list the task and why it was important. So you need to kind of finish the thought on each of those um, bullet points and make sure you're including that because that will set you apart when people are reading resume. It will absolutely set you apart to say, this person did this task and look at what it did, what positive impact it had. It takes a bit of thinking. (laughs) <laughs> to get these ones right. And I will say it took me a while after I had that advice to go back to my resume and, and fix it to be sure that I was in fact answering that question, that, that so what question around um, each of the things that I did that I, I found to be so routine and that people should know why they were important. But in fact, I hadn't actually told them why it was important. I have a question. Yeah. I was wondering what happens if you're doing a lot of administrative tasks and you're just listing them like it's hard to say that when you photocopy, pay invoices, answer phones, book uh, travel and stuff like that, like 
um, to answer that so what part of the question. And if you don't put it in, people don't know what you've done. So it's kind of like, well, I think you absolutely have to put it in. I mean, the, you know, the administrative parts of people's jobs are sometimes the most important part of people's jobs, you know, because that's, that's what assists other people. And I would say, you know, it, it almost does take a little bit of that really, you know, soul searching, like, okay, so when I'm booking people's travel, why is that important? Well, it's important because the person that you might be booking it for then doesn't have to do it. You know, you're, you're increasing their ability to be productive because you're doing it for them. So, you know, if that was the case, if you're booking your own travel, it's different, but you know, whatever that, that administrative task is, there's, there's a reason why you're doing it. And the reason why you're doing it is to improve something. It's to allow someone else to be more productive. If you're filing, you know, the fact that you're filing in an up-to-date and accurate way is driving an efficiency within the organization, because then that record, that whatever that record is, that record in that document is where it should be when the person needs it. So it's really just thinking about, okay, how does my work, how does this task that I do impact other people? So how does it fit into the overall fabric of the department or of the organization? Because there's all, there always is a so what. It's just a matter of getting to like to what that is. And sometimes it's a matter of asking other people, you know, that are in your company or that you've worked with or even just a friend to say, okay, so, you know, why is this important? And just brainstorm that because it always is. I mean, all the tasks that every person in an organization does are extremely important and they may not seem important to that person, but they're important to other people. So it's trying to really get to the, the crux of, you know, why is it important? No, what I mean is like, for example, I have experience that's wide ranging, like yeah. in politics, law and men. Yeah. And it's just more like I'm listing what I've done yeah. uh, to support them. But it's like technical rather than saying, so what? Yeah, I've, I've alleviated the pressure of my boss having to deal with the nitty gritty operations of running two offices, for example. Like it's kind of like it's I, I don't know how to like this slide, what, what is getting at in terms of answering that? So what part, like I'm listing the duties is what I'm saying, yeah. but I'm not sure how to frame it. So that sounds exciting to say, yeah, so what part, you know what I mean? No, not really. Well, this, <laughs> no, I get it. And, but I mean, the, so what part doesn't have to be particularly, you know, exciting per se. It just needs to be why that's important. It's you, you need to answer to the reader, what what the result of you doing those tasks was and i think you just said it just now it's it is it's alleviating it's alleviating someone else from having to do those tasks so it's just finding a way to say that so you if you were listing off you know filing photocopying booking travel um it may be just as simple as saying that you did that um that you did those things which resulted in greater efficiency of your manager or the department so like list like basically what you're saying is list all the duties and then put in a line increase um, the productivity of the office by uh, alleviating the pressure of the manager kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, got it. So you're just basically you're just kind of finishing that thought. So instead of saying because I see this very very often in resumes and often it is those administrative tasks where where we kind of fall short on explaining that second piece is people will simply list. Um, you know, filed documents, greeted customers, input, did data entry of expenses, and they kind of leave it at that. When really, if they were to word that in a different way, it would really illustrate the importance of those things, because it's extremely important that someone answered the phone and greeted the customer and passed them to the appropriate person. I mean, that contributes enormously to the success and, and to that customer's experience of the organization and filing documents, you know, again, it's, it's, it's very important that that be done correctly and that that be done in a way that allows that person who needs to access that record to go and find it quickly and to be able to do what they need to do with it. So, you know, instead of just listing it, it's listing, you know, what did that accomplish at the end of the day? What did that allow to happen? And putting it right into that bullet point. One of the it was at one of the events that um, that Dress for Success did, and and there was a there was a lady on my table that was exactly her resume was exactly that, and she and I were chatting over lunch, and you know it was it was very much a list of all the administrative things that she had done, and I said okay, but these are important, you know these are really important things. So we spent you know ten minutes over lunch and just reworded it, 
And she sort of chuckled and said, well, gosh, that makes me seem very important. I'm like, well, you are, <laughs> you know, you are that important, you know, but that, it's just wording, right? It's just the wording. So if I'm reading a resume that just simply lists them, that's not going to have as much of an impact you know, for me as the HR person or the hiring manager, then to, to read one that has those listed that says, well, and here's what that means to the company that I did that, you know, I did these things and here's what it means that I did them. This is why it's important that you know that I did them. It just reads so much more positively and so much more impactful, you know, for the person reading it, they're like, okay, well, this person, this person knows what they're doing and they know their contribution. They understand their contribution and, and why it's important that they do what they do. It can mm-hmm. make a difference. Cool. Thank you. No problem. Um, Jennifer, before we move on, there is a question in the chat um, asking if you can list, list the task and what is accomplished. Yeah. So ideally we'd all kind of blend into one, um, into one bullet point. So, which I know is kind of hard to get your head around because it it was for me too, but, um, but yes, so the, yeah, you would list both. They wouldn't be listed separately though. You'd try to work it right into the wording of the, of the task. This talks about hobbies and interests. So again, I get a lot of questions around this. People say, well, do you ever like, do HR people really care? Like, do they ever really read it? Does anybody look at this section of my resume? And I'll be honest and say, the truth is we don't pay a lot of attention to this. We pay some attention to this, but we don't pay a lot of attention to this, particularly because this tends to be something that's like on page two or in a little section at the end. Um, I think that you can you can use this section if you even choose to put it in. It, you don't have to. But if you choose to and you want to, I think use it to your advantage. This is another situation where if it's going to take up real estate on your resume, make it matter. So if you're going to list hobbies and interests, be skillful about it. What I would say is when I'm looking at hobbies and interests, and normally I'm doing that with, you know, recent grads or people who have limited um, job experience, or perhaps people that have a gap in their job experience, that's when I would tend to look at this. Um, If you're going to list it, Be creative in the way that you present it. So I've given a couple examples here. Very visual, doesn't take up a lot of space, more graphic than words. And be prepared to to list, again, why is it important? So what I tend to look for in here, if people are going to list their hobbies and interests, are things that show organization skills, that show leadership skills. So it might be very important to me that you ran your child's soccer team because that means you are very organized, you are very patient, you know how to wrangle little children into doing what you need them to do. You know, there are a lot of things about that that are transferable skills into the workplace. Lots of things about that experience. So there's a lot of value in listing things like that. Um, There can be things on here that are creative. So if you're going to be applying to a creative role. You may want to list that you are a hobby photographer, that you like to do that in your spare time, or that you enjoy, you know, whatever kind of musical instrument that you play, like something that lends itself to creativity if you're applying to a job that is creative in nature. So what I would say is if you're going to list hobbies and interests, try to make it relevant. Try to make it very relevant to the role that you're that you're applying to and, and be sure to list those things that show leadership, that show initiative, that show organizational skills and creativity and try to relate it in some way to a skill that would be useful. Oh, uh, there's a question in the chat. Yeah. Um, is it um, oh. is sewing or knitting um, showing that I am creative and creative enough and have a lot of patience for an IT job? Sure. Absolutely. I think it's all in the way that that you present it. So if you have a creative side and you want the organization to know that you have a creative side, then absolutely include it. I don't think there's any harm in including it. And also use this section to show them a little bit about who you are as a person, because you know that, um, and I'm sure you've heard this and, and HR people overuse it as do HR or hiring managers. They're looking for fit. So they're looking for fit on the team, fit in the organization, fit in the department. So you're going to hear that word over and over again. It's it's become a bit of a buzzword. 
Um, but they are looking to see, will this person get along with the other people in the organization? Will they fit in with the other coworkers that they're, you know, that they're going to be with day in, day out or virtually day in, day out? Um, so, you know, this section can lend itself to that too. You know, does this person share common interests to the people on the team or do they have interests that the people on the team are going to think are pretty cool and they're going to want to ask them about it? So it, it can also convey who you are as a person and a little bit about your personality. Actually, I was told that if you are a person who is experienced, um, um, like, for example, you're not a recent grad, mm -hmm. then you don't put that in because it shows that you have no experience because you're filling in a void on the resume. So yeah. don't kind of like, um, you want to avoid the impression that you like don't have much, space, like kind of you thing. don't, you, like you don't have uh, much professional experience like you're um, if you're older you don't put that in uh, yeah. is what I was told but you're saying that that's not yeah. the case anymore I think, I think it's a per well I think it's a personal choice like like most things on your resume right I think it's a personal choice if you want to talk about your hobbies and interests then go for it I think you just try to be strategic about it that's all I mean I know lots of executive people that put things like this on their resume I mean gosh one of the CEOs that I worked with has it like very clearly on his LinkedIn and on his resume that he is a photographer. He that's important to him that people know that about him. He's a CEO, but he also wants people to know he has this creative side and that he's artistic and that's important for him for people to know that. So I think it's very personal. I think as long as you use it in a strategic way, you're, you're right in saying, don't throw it in there just to use up space. Don't do that. You know, if that's all it's doing, don't do that. If you're using it for a different purpose to convey your personality and so forth, then I think you should include it. It's not on mine, for example, but again, personal choice. You know, it's mm -hmm. just a personal choice that I don't put it on, but there's nothing wrong with having it on. Yeah, especially if you're in politics and you want to show that you could take pictures for events um, to sure. help the boss ask good or yeah. uh, you have debating skills or public speaking skills um, mm -hmm. kind of thing then. Yeah. Absolutely. And what, you know, when I do, um, cause I occasionally do sessions, you know, with again, junior intermediate level people, but you know, what I'd say to them on this section is, you know, I may very well care a lot about the fact that you bake, but you have to tell me why I should care that you bake, you know, or, you know, I might care very much that you are a little league coach, but you kind of need to tell me why I should care that you're a little league coach, you know, so try to use it to convey something. So, you know, if you're going to put that you volunteer as a, you know, as a soccer coach, it's, you know, you might want to say that you use organization, leadership skills, you know, et cetera, in being a little league coach for whatever the, the name of the, you know, the name of the, the team is, but you might want to kind of elaborate a little bit on that if you feel it's necessary. So you're saying for when we do the interests and hobbies, we're actually writing a sentence rather than a bullet point, this listing. Yeah. You can. Yeah. Depends on how many you're going to list. I mean, these examples here are mm -hmm. people that did it very visually and just used words. I mean, I love the one person on here that's, you know, stand up comedy. I think that's fantastic. I would love <laughs> like, and if I'm reading that resume, I'm thinking like, this would be a fantastic person on my team, you know, depending on what that means, as long as they're not like sort of class clown version, but you know, things like that. But if you want to list it, I mean, these are very visual. Some people simply list it. Or it's in, um, I actually did a resume for a lady recently where she wanted to include some of her hobbies, but she did it, she wanted it sort of in a margin. So we did it in a margin and she wanted to list a couple of things. She does a lot of um, charity runs. And so she wanted to put that on there that she was a, a runner and that she volunteered in a lot of charity runs. So we put a little bit of language around that because really for her, she was applying for um, like EA type work. And the fact that she was involved in these charity runs means she was organizing, you know, she was, she was getting a team together. She wasn't just showing up and running. She was actually doing a lot of things that, that really lent themselves to the job that she wanted. So we included a bit of language around it just to make sure that it was conveying what she wanted. Oh, awesome. Good to know. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the next piece, and it's not on the next slide, but it's just something that I think, you know, I get a lot of questions around and I think it's important for us to probably bring up is addressing gaps on your resume. Lots of us have gaps on our resume for various reasons. I mean, at the end of the day, life happens and there's lots of reasons why you might have a gap 
on your resume. So, you know, sometimes they're voluntary gaps. So you've taken a personal sabbatical for some reason, you've done um, an educational sabbatical. So you've gone back to school. You might have taken time off to raise children. You might've taken time off to care for an elder. There's lots of reasons why a voluntary sabbatical might happen. There's also the involuntary gap on a resume because you've been restructured or let go for some reason. And there is a gap as a result of that. So these things happen. My advice on gaps on resumes is if the gap occurred more than 10 to 15 years ago, don't include it. If it's more recent, if it's within 10 to 15 years, you don't want to lie on a resume. So showing the gap is fine, but you'll want to have some kind of statement to give to the hiring manager or the HR person to explain the gap. What I don't think is necessary is to tell a whole bunch of personal information about yourself. You need to have some explanation for it, but you don't need to tell people the details of your personal situation. So don't feel compelled to do that. What I would suggest is come up with a statement that describes that gap. So maybe it's, I took a year off because I had to deal with um, a personal situation within my family. During that year, I, whatever, come up with something that you did. So it doesn't have to be um, personal details, but chances are during that time that you were not working, you were still gaining skills. You might've been gaining organizational skills if you were caring for an elder and how to bring them back and forth to doctor's appointments and deal with you know, potentially retirement homes, things like that. You probably were developing a skill or you probably were using a skill that is applicable to the workplace. So focus on that in your statement because lots of non-traditional work is still work. Raising children, as we know, is work. T taking care of elders is work. So it's trying to pull from that experience, what are the things that I did that would be skills that I was using during that gap in my workplace work that I can at least talk about if asked about this gap. So come up with a statement. But again, don't feel the need and don't feel compelled to give a whole bunch of personal information. You are not obliged to do that, but you will need to explain it. Chances are. Um, so my question is, do you write it down somewhere or do you not put it in and just explain it in an interview? Well, they'll see it on your resume. So they'll see that there's normally um, the very beginning of, of an interview. It's normally an interview section. So, you know, you, that interview, they'll see, they'll go through your resume with you and they'll see that there's a gap. Um, have a statement that you have prepared is what I would suggest. Prepare a statement. Don't necessarily have it, you know, written down, but just prepare something in your mind that is your response. If asked, you know, what did you do between this date and this date? I see that you were not in an organization. Come up with something like, that you are comfortable with sharing. Like, yeah. Like for example, I filled my time with volunteer work. Does that right. count as gap or not gap? Well, if it was a time that you were not working and it will look mm -hmm. on your resume as though you were not working, but you were volunteering, then that's, I mean, that's a, and that's a perfect thing to be able to say. If someone says, so what did you do for this year that I see that you were not, you know, in, in an organization, you can say, I took the year I was, I was doing a job search and I was volunteering for whatever organizations doing whatever it was you were doing during that time. So I think it's really just, you need to come up with a statement that you're comfortable with sharing to explain that gap, because chances are you're going to have to explain it. They're probably oh, not going to just let you off the hook. <laughs> They're probably going to no, 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 like, like, no, what I mean is like, I don't have a problem with uh, ex explaining my situation. The problem is, do I put that in writing in the resume section cover letter or wait until I actually get to the interview stage and yeah, then explain. I, I think you, you address it if they ask, because in your resume, you know, if you think about if you're doing a reverse chronological resume, it's going to be mm -hmm. obvious, right? Yeah. Because there's going to be a gap. There's going to be, you know, from the, the time you left one job to the time you started another, there's going to be a gap. So they'll probably pick up on that and they'll say, Hey, mm -hmm. you know, what did you do during these six months or nine months or whatever it happens to be? And then you can answer the question then. I wouldn't necessarily fill it in as its own section because I, mm -hmm. 
I just, I don't think that's necessary. I think they're going to see it and let them initiate that question. Yeah. Cause I have a mixed reaction. Like some people, some employers are okay with the fact I have volunteer, like unpaid experience and other people yeah. are like, wow, you didn't work for quite a while for money. Something's wrong with you. <laughs> that kind of attitude. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, it's bizarre. Well, um, and I think sometimes you have to think about, you know, when you have a gap and you're asked about that gap and you give an honest statement as to what happened during that time, if that employer has an issue with that answer, that's probably telling you something too. With most things, as much as when we're doing a job search, of course, we want to land a job. And of course, we want to you know, become employed with these organizations. But you also need to be vetting the organization for your values and for what you need out of a boss and a company. And so if you're being transparent and you're giving a statement about, you know, what that gap is and, and your feelings about it, or, you know, giving some detail, if their reaction is not a positive one, then that should tell you that informs you about them as well. Yeah. I think we just, we have to pay attention as candidates as well. Cause so often I think we get very focused on, I really, really want this job. You know, I really, really want it. And we get so focused on that, that we ignore that we're actually supposed to be interviewing them too, because this has to work for me as a candidate, as much as it has to work for them as an organization. Yeah. I just wasn't sure if it's one of those things where, why people are so critical of people who choose to um, tend to life, I guess. Um, yeah. And then go back to the workforce. It's not like we're robots and we have no. to work continuously, <laughs> kind of thing. No, and I think that's you know, and I think that's that's you know what you come up with in terms of your statement is to say you know you may even want to be proactive in the interview to say you may notice that there is a gap in paid work experience and here is what I did during that time and to me that was very purposeful and it was very meaningful work and I consider that to be work although it is not necessarily traditional in the sense that it was paid work, but this is what I did. And this is why it was purposeful and meaningful for me. Yeah. For me, I was just lucky that it was, um, it gave me executive level skills compared to if I was doing paid work, it will still be admin support, which right. doesn't help me at all long-term. Right. So, exactly. Yeah. Yep. And I think you just, you have to come up with a statement that explains it in a way that you are comfortable with and that conveys what you want to convey. Right. Thank you. I really forgot to the statement that's prepared are the proper gap statements, but you know, what if we just apply a job and you know, would the recruiter actually uh, discount us if saying that there's gaps in the resume and say, oh, I don't know what's happening, so just discount us and not giving us an opportunity for an interview? Because in that case, it's like you know, when you go into the interview, you can explain the gap, but if you're not selected because there's a gap, I mean, what's the cost? How do we actually show that? you know, the gap was something like maybe take time off to attend to family or, or stuff. Right. Like that. Yeah, you're right. And you can't, I mean, that's where the human aspect comes in. You can't, yeah. we can't predict what a person will do when they see that gap in a resume. We can't predict whether that hiring manager simply puts it aside or whether that hiring manager cares to ask the question and move the person on to an interview. If you are more comfortable putting one line in to explain that period of time if it's if it's important to you that a person knows that mm -hmm. then feel free to do that but again i would just say don't feel compelled to give personal information if you are not comfortable doing that mm -hmm. but if you are comfortable doing that and you want to put i wouldn't go into a lot of detail i would just mm -hmm. you know and, and you could simply list it as you know personal sabbatical or mm -hmm you know, childcare sabbatical, you could, you know, list it in some kind of generic way. And you might want to put a little bit, one or two sentences if you wish to explain it. But I, again, it's, to me, it's always a little bit of a question of protecting your personal privacy. Okay. You know, yes, you want to get an interview, but you also don't, you don't need to be telling people too much information mm -hmm. when it's not relevant for them to know. So just put it on their resume now. You can if you wish okay. to. You can okay. if you wish to. Okay. I often see it just, it's just a gap and the, the person doesn't address it with anything. It's just, it's just a gap. And so the HR person asks or the, the hiring manager asks, but if you'd rather explain it and be very transparent and upfront and say, look, from this date to this date, I was on a personal sabbatical and here's what, here's some detail on that. Then go ahead. I just, I'd be, 
I'd want to protect your privacy a little bit and be careful about what statement you put in there. What um, I think you want to focus on too with gaps, and this is an important piece, is when you are writing that statement or when you are coming up with that statement that you wish to say, it's important that the person you're saying it to or the person that's reading it understands that the purpose for that sabbatical or the purpose for that gap is now satisfied or resolved. So you want them to understand that this is not an open item that may reoccur a month from now, because that might be the thing that deters them from having you in for an interview or for, or for continuing the conversation. So you want it to be conveyed either verbally once you get to that statement piece, or if you're going to put it in a resume and address it, make sure that it's obvious that, look, this the reason for this is now satisfied, it is now resolved, and I am eagerly wanting to return to the work, like the workforce. Um, is how to explain a gap if you were let go due to a human rights issue with your former employer? Yeah, you don't want to get into, you don't want to get into um, contentious things, I would say, um, in terms of how you would explain it. I think I would simply, yeah, especially if it's an open claim, which I, you know, I get the sense it might be an open claim. Um, I think what you want to do is just, if, it, if you're asked, you say that you're no longer with that organization and that you're now job searching. I don't think you wanna get into the details of, of what's going on. And if there's a legal claim outstanding, you're actually not, you probably aren't permitted to. So I would just leave it at that, just to say my employer and I parted ways and I'm now doing a job search. You have to be a little bit careful if there's a claim that's open. I don't know if that's the situation here, but you know, often that is the situation. If there's some kind of open claim, you just want to be very brief and just say that you were, you could, you could say that you were exited from the organization. If you wanted to say that, it kind of depends on how much information you want to share. But in regards to private information, um, can you list the form of communication you prefer, such as an email instead of your phone number, address, email? I don't want my private information going to various companies that might not even hire me. Yeah. So in ter um, I think what you mean is on your resume itself, what you actually list in okay. terms of con like how they get in touch with you. Absolutely. So as an example, if you look at the top of my resume and we don't have to flip back to it necessarily, but I don't list my address. I don't even list the city that I live in. I give my cell phone number and my email address and my LinkedIn link. That's it. It's become more and more common for people not to list their address and too much personal information. When you're going through an applicant tracking system, I think a lot of that is still mandatory. Mm. So just to keep that in mind, so you may not, you don't need to put it on your resume. If the, if the means of communication with you is that you want them to call your cell phone or email you, then that's what you would put on your resume. However, um, when you go through an applicant tracking system, often those fields are not optional. They put the little asterisks beside the things that you must fill in. So a lot of the times you can't, you can't get past that screen unless you fill something in there. So uh, regard, back to that question of having a gap in your resume. Yes. Uh, I, I, with my experience, like, you know, I have not mentioned on my resume that I have a gap of one year in my resume okay because it was a voluntary sabbatical and I was taking care of definitely it is so true that an elderly person in my house which is still not resolved okay. but uh, I'm I'm ready to go back to the job and eagerly applying also so um, I have seen with my experience that recruiters response that you know and they understand that you have a gap and they you know send your application further to the companies but uh, so far, when I have applied directly to the companies, I have not even received a single response. So right. should I mention it in the cover letter saying that I have a gap or should I keep on doing what I'm doing and just sending to the recruiters and explaining them my gap? So are you concerned that you're not getting a response to your resume because they can see that there's a gap? Yes. Okay. So you may want to put a brief, again, very brief statement into your cover letter, or maybe if you think it would help, you can always test drive these things, right? You can see if it helps. And then if it doesn't, you can change it back, um, is address that in your resume by putting 
you know, I think as one of the other ladies mentioned, just a, a real quick couple lines that explain that time. And I would refer to it as a sabbatical, a personal sabbatical, and then just maybe put a line in there that says, you know, that you were off due to an elder care, a personal elder mm-hmm. care requirement, and leave it at that. So on LinkedIn profile, you know, since I'm doing LinkedIn networking as well nowadays, so one of the good expert, he advised me to put that line as taking care of so many things at the top. <laughs> but I mean, I've, whatever advice we get, we put on. But yeah. so far, I'm just wondering, you know, what works? And it really depends on who's reading it. I mean, when it comes to this sort of thing, unfortunately, it is a little bit of trial and error. It's a little bit of try this and see if it works. And if that doesn't, then try something else because you never know who's going to be reading it. You know, you just never know who's going to be reading it. And so one person who reads it will look at it and go, okay, that's not an issue at all. That's understandable. That's part of life. And they would forward it on and, you know, advance the person in the, um, you know, in the process Another individual might look at it and go, oh, I don't know about that because she might be off a lot and not advance the person. But I would go back to that same point that I made earlier. That tells you something about the organization. I get it. If if they're not valuing that Mm -hmm. period of time as a personal requirement that many of us face, then that tells you something about mm. that organization. You, you want to work for the organization that looks at that and does not take issue with it, but rather understands it and allows that person to continue in the recruiting process. Yeah, thanks Jennifer. Yeah, I think this statement keeps us moving. <laughs> yeah, I think if you wanna put a statement in there just to, just to kind of see if it keeps you going through the process, then that's a good idea. Yeah, no, I mean, you're saying that, you know, that means that employer is not fit to join. <laughs> And I I know I stress this a lot with people who are in their job search. We get really focused on, we just want the job. We just really, really want the job because we have a vision of what this job is in our head. And then, you know, we bump up against an interviewer or a hiring manager that feels as though they have judged something negatively that we have in a way that we've answered a question or something on our resume. And that should inform the way we feel about that employer. It should but sometimes we just get really excited. We want the job, you know, and then we get there and our values don't align with theirs. And then you've got a different problem. You've got a job, (laughs) but you've got a job in an organization who doesn't share your values. And you want a manager in an organization that shares your values, because if you don't have that, it's going to be a daily struggle, a daily, you know, juggling of, you know, this doesn't feel right. And the reason it doesn't feel right is because you're not aligned on things that are really core to who you are. So I think we need to pay more attention to that as candidates. So cover letters, there's building blocks for cover letters. Um, And this is another area where people say, okay, but do you really read it? (laughs) Do HR people really read it if they're getting all these resumes? What I will say is HR people are probably not spending a lot of time reading it, but hiring managers are definitely spending time reading it. So when you look at the way that most um, recruiting processes work, the HR person gets the big stack of resumes. They do the quick sort and they shortlist. The shortlist is what goes to the hiring manager. And the shortlist that goes to the hiring manager, that hiring manager might only get five to 10 resumes. They're going to spend a lot more time reading over those five to 10 resumes in detail than the HR person spends on the 50 to 100 resumes that they have in the stack. So what I would say about cover letters is know your audience. Your audience is probably the hiring manager, not the HR person. And if you're going through an applicant tracking system, it's a computer. (laughs) So all you're doing is looking for keywords. So it really just depends on who your audience is. So when you're um, spending time on cover letters, if you're going to include a cover letter, what I would say is make sure that you're spending time writing it well. So personalize it for sure. So if you don't know the name of the person that you're writing it to, don't put things like to whom it may concern. Um, Put dear recruiter, dear hiring manager, or if you can go on LinkedIn and look at who posted the job, sometimes you can actually see who the person is. So if you can use that resource and you can actually see who the job poster was, 
put their name on it. If you don't have that option, then at least put, you know, a dear recruiter, dear hiring manager, something like that. Don't put to whom you may concern. We sometimes get that and it just, it just doesn't, it doesn't have the same feeling to it as if you're putting something else. What you want to keep in mind with, um, again, and I, and I said this about the, the bio versus the profile, your resume is the facts about you. Your cover letter tells the reader why you're the right person for the job. So make sure that your cover letter is not simply a reiteration of the facts that are already in your resume. You wanted to say something different. So this is kind of more of your, you know, your personal sort of touch around who you are and why you're right for the job. So personalizing it with a dear somebody is important. Um, and then look at some kind of catchy opening line. So, you know, something that's interesting. So, and I give some examples of this in the handout. So um, you don't have to worry about writing anything down or, or I might not be able to come up with something on the spot, but it's in the handout is some kind of catchy opening line. So you could say, you know, in my case, I could say as an HR professional, I excel at partnering with leaders in ensuring employee success. I'm totally making that up right now, but something like that. Right. So, and I've given a few that you can just fill in the blanks with your own information. So it's in the handout, but come up with something that is catchy that you're starting out with something that grabs attention because you don't want your cover letter to be long. You want it to be quite short and you want it to be very to the point. So here's who I am. Here's a little bit about me and here's how you want to hire me, why you want to hire me. And I expect to hear from you. You know, that's really your ingredients. So once you have your catchy opening line, then you've got your sales pitch and your sales pitch is basically that previous slide that I showed of how you build the pitch around who you are. So a few statements that say, you know, here's some keywords about me that I know are from the job posting. So make sure you put some keywords in there from the job posting that you're relating it to something. And here's why you want me. So something engaging. So I think you had my bio um, on a previous slide that said, you know, I'm an HR professional. I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been in small companies of 60. I've been in big companies of 78,000. I do this because I'm passionate about employee success. And I know as an HR professional that what we do contributes to the overall success of the organization. There's my pitch, right? There's the middle of my cover letter, basically. Um, and then some kind of strong closing statement that is a call to action. So you want that closing statement to ask them to do something. So it should say something like, you know, I really feel strongly about the contribution I can make to your organization and I'd love to hear from you next week. Or I look forward to talking to you further. So it's some kind of call to action that makes them go, oh, okay. You know, that they're more, more apt to then go, yeah, maybe I will continue this conversation with this person. Maybe I will have them in for a conversation next week. You know, some kind of closing statement that actually asks them to do something. If the company that you worked for has not so great reviews, um, does it affect your opportunity of getting hired? Unless those reviews speak specifically about you, which they shouldn't, um, I would say no. If the person that's interviewing you has looked up the company, and as an example, if you work for an organization and you're, you were in customer service and I look at that organization and I see that their customer service is getting blasted on social media, maybe as the interviewer, I would say, so, you know, the organization doesn't have the best reputation for customer service. So talk to me about that. I might do that. I would say that in a lot of cases, the person that is the hiring manager that's doing the interview or the HR person probably isn't going to that great a degree. They might look at some of these things. But I, I would be surprised if someone who's interviewing you would look at a, res, um, a review online and hold that particular interviewee accountable for answering to that. I'd be surprised if that happened. If you know that your company has a terrible reputation, you might want to just come up with, again, in your head, come up with some statement that says something about that. But I'd, I'd be surprised if it came up. So as I mentioned ATS is, so ATS is applicant tracking system. You probably have come into contact with lots of them um, in your job search. So there's various versions. There's Taleo, there's Jobbyte, there's all kinds of different ones that you may not even know that you're in an applicant tracking system, but whenever you're flipped over to a screen where you have to upload your resume and put in a bunch of details about yourself, that's an applicant tracking system. Sometimes they look like the company's website, but it's actually a totally separate um, site. They just brand it to look like part of the, um, the website. So when you are um, 
put into an applicant tracking system rather than going straight to a person, an HR person or a hiring manager. Um, it means that you have to make sure that your resume is optimized for that. So not only should it be visually appealing for the humans that look at it, but it actually needs to speak to the artificial intelligence of some of these applicant tracking systems as well. Um, companies use these most of the time, especially large companies. So it's hard to get away from this now. You're not often getting just a person. You're normally hitting the ATS first before you get to the person. Um, and artificial intelligence is used for so many different parts of recruiting. So sometimes it's just screening the resumes. So once you go into the applicant tracking system, the um, the technology parses your resume for certain keywords, and it will then put you into a queue on the, on the um, HR person side, and it'll show the people that are best matched to least matched for the job. And then they'll pull sort of the top 20 or whatever, and take a look at those. So sometimes it's just screening the resumes. Sometimes um, there's like a little they call them, it's like a chat bot. So sometimes there's this little feature that actually will, will um, interact with you as a candidate to schedule meetings, schedule interviews, and ask you a few preliminary questions. So sometimes you'll see that as well. And then on the most extreme um, version, you might actually be interviewed by the AI. So I actually did this maybe six months ago. I was applying for a position and I, my first interview was with a computer. There was no person on the other side of it. It was just a computer asking me questions and I answered the questions to the computer. And that was my first interview. So that's an extreme case. You don't see that very often, but it's more and more common. So be prepared to interact with technology in your job search. Even if all you're doing is just on that very front end being screened by an applicant tracking system. So you need to make sure that you're structuring your resume so that it's attractive to that piece of technology. So um, how to do that. So make sure that your resume includes keywords from the job posting. So if they talk about specific education that you have, make sure you say it in exactly that same way. So when a recruiter puts a job into an applicant tracking system, they're putting in most of the time, just the job posting. And then they may add a few other keywords. So if you are applying to a role, make sure that your resume lists those things in exactly the same format. So if they're saying, um, if they spell out, for example, if they spell out um, master's in business administration, you should spell out master's in business administration and not put MBA. So make sure that your words on your resume are matching the ones that are on the job posting. So make sure they're there. Um, and then, you know, things like, length of service at, at you know, each of your um, roles, make sure all those things that are important are in your resume and clearly spelled out. Make sure also that you, um, you use lots of adjectives. So use the same adjectives that they would use in the posting. So if the posting says that you need to have strong MS Excel skills, use the word strong, because it's probably gonna match you to that word. So often the first step when you're, when you're being screened by an ATS, it's just looking for keywords, it's looking for similar words. So make sure that you've used the same words. So pretty simple. Um, avoid groupings. So another thing to keep in mind, if the posting specifically says they want experience in MS Word, MS Excel, and MS PowerPoint, on your resume, make sure that it says that, don't say MS Office which is tempting because you know that MS Office is all three of those programs. But if it, if it pieces them out, then you should do that too. So it's really just matching. It's like a little matching game is just make sure that your resume matches the way that the job posting looks. Um, things to avoid, fancy artwork. Be careful about fancy artwork and fancy formatting because when an ATS is the thing that gets your resume first, sometimes graphics, can throw it off and it'll actually just dump your resume right out. Like it, it won't even get past the initial screening because it can't read it properly. So avoid things like fancy artwork, avoid things like um, overly scripty font, like just stick with your basic font, like your Tahoma, your Arial, your Calibri, like stick with very um, basic font styles, nothing too artistic. Um, stick with uh, very basic bullets. So if you're using bullet points, just use the plain old traditional 
bullet points. Um, they work best because an ATS can handle that. If when you do anything too artistic or different, sometimes again, it knocks it out of the system. Um, pay attention. If in the job posting, it says, please submit your resume as a Word document. Don't submit it as a PDF. So pay attention to how they're asking you to submit it. And normally they will say they want it as a dot doc or a dot doc X. They'll say what they want. So if they're saying that, stick with that. Don't give them a different format. Um, it's tempting sometimes to use a PDF because a PDF locks all your formatting so that it can't be changed and it doesn't get manipulated. If what you're applying to specifically says that it wants a Word document, research a little bit into Word. You actually can lock the formatting in Word. It's a feature. So you don't have to use a PDF to lock your formatting. So if that's the reason why you're using a PDF and a posting is asking specifically for a Word document, just do a little research in the help function. There is actually a way to lock your formatting in Word so that you don't need to convert it to a PDF to do that. Um, headers and footers. When you're using headers and footers, be careful what content you're putting in them. If you're using a header and a footer for your name and your contact information, make sure it's somewhere else on your resume too. Sometimes headers and footers get knocked out of ATSs. It doesn't read them. So it won't actually end up being put into your profile. So make sure that if you're using the header and the footer for your name and your phone number or your name and your email, put that somewhere else too. It's fine to put it in the footer because maybe visually it looks nice, but make sure it's somewhere else too, in actual just plain typed font. Um, last thing, and this is something that I did recently because you'll see from that, even from that little bit of my resume, I tend to use PDFs for my resume because I put pictures and there's a little bit of formatting and things like that. What I do though, um, and I was told, again, I was told by the, the person that was helping me with my resume a little while back, um, what I do is I cut and paste all of the content from my resume into either a blank Word document or into Notepad, and I see what it does. Because what it looks like when you do that is what the ATS will see, because it only sees the text. So I cut and paste into a blank document, and if something looks weird, I go back to the original and I fix it there so that it doesn't look all jumbled and funny, which is how I kind of came across some of these things that just don't, they just don't translate. They don't work when you put it into plain text. So I would suggest you do that. If you want to have a little bit more creative looking resume, cut and paste it into a blank document just to be sure that all the content that you need looks correct. My experience has been that the job descriptions are written in a way that asks you uh, to be able to do your job and everything that you wish you could do as well. So when you add your resume, for the AI, it seems that you're, um, it seems to be required to match at least 90% of the keywords. But when you go for the interview, you might not be able to do all of those wished for tasks, even if you're able to do the tasks that are included in your actual position. Right. How can you get around this catch 22 situation? So I think what you're saying is it's sort of the, the job hosting is a bit of a laundry list of like wishes, not necessarily what would be involved in the job. So I don't know if I'm understanding that to mean that you sort of put them on your resume just to make sure that the ATS grabs you. Is that yeah, yeah, yeah that's what mean? Yeah. Okay. So I mean, there's no harm in doing that, but I'm always a little cautious about, you know, don't say something on your resume that isn't true. Don't tell them you can do something that you can't do because eventually they're gonna figure it out and then you're gonna have a problem. So, you know, try to be honest about your skills. And make sure that what you're putting in is something you can actually back up later when they ask you to do it. And you're right. Sometimes the job descriptions are absolutely a wish list. And if the HR person at that organization is doing their job, then they're probably doing the gut check with the hiring manager that says, okay, but how much of this is actually necessary? Does everyone else on your team that does this job have all these skills? And if the answer is no, then they should be tailoring it. Doesn't always happen. But if the HR person is doing their job really well, it shouldn't happen that you've got this weird wish list of things that really 
intuitively you know are not necessary for that role. Great. Um, I have a question. I was told by employment specialists that we don't so-called, I guess the word they use is plagiarize the job posting. We have to put it into our own words. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. So don't, I, what I would say is when you're doing, um, and this is sort of goes back to the cover letter. So when you're doing your cover letter, don't just pull whatever's on the job posting and, and do that. Like you want it to be personal. You want it to talk about you and things that make you, you as a candidate and don't make your resume exactly what the job posting is, because again, you want those bullet points, like we talked about, you want the bullet points to talk about your contribution. You want them to talk about what you accomplished in doing all of those tasks, but you do want to match certain things. So, you know, like I said, if you, if they're using the word strong MS office skills, put that in your resume. Like you want to do a little bit of word matching back and forth, not to say that you want your resume to just be a carbon copy of the job posting, because that's, I mean, that's, that's not going to grab, I mean, you might get you past the ATS, but that's as far as you're going to get, right? Because it's going to be obvious that that's what you did. So just make sure you've done that keyword matching. Match as many words as you possibly can. Because I use synonyms instead, but you're saying don't because you want to s- bypass the ATS? Where are, you using the, where are you using the synonyms? Like in, in like, the- like, 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 for example, for the, let's use the example of city of Toronto job hostings. I would yeah. use synonyms so that I'm not looking like I'm spitting um, uh, the job posting into my resume kind of thing. So I will use synonyms, for example, they'll say like time, like good time management, right? And they'll be like, um, I'll use the synonym for that. Maybe i will say I'm uh, efficient. Right with my time or something like that. Right. So I'm not using the exact word time management. I'll say efficient with my workload or something like that. Right. To show the yeah. same thing. I think as long as you're being factual, you can use some of the same words, but your whole resume shouldn't look like the job posting. I mean, they're right in saying that you don't want your whole resume to look just like the job posting. Cause that's going to be fairly obvious to the person that's looking at it. Mm-hmm. You know, once you get past the ATS, but you do still, you want to have keywords because applicant tracking systems are, that's what they're using. They're using keywords. So you do want to have enough of those keywords that it filters you into the right pile. Like you want to be in the yes pile. <laughs> you want to be at the top of that queue. You don't want to be at the bottom of the queue. So, I mean, I think, I think in your cover letter and definitely in your interview, you want to use your own language. You want it to be yourself. You want to present who you are as a candidate, certainly, in those two scenarios. On your resume, you have to pay some attention to matching those keywords. Oh, okay. So it's a bit of a blend of both. I mean, it it kind of has to be a blend of both because you want enough keywords that you're getting past the ATS. You don't want it to be a carbon copy of the posting, but you want enough of those words in there that it's kind of pushing you to the top of the pile. I see. The queue. Because you kind of, what will happen is once you go through the ATS, what, what I see, like what the HR person would see on the other side is it's a queue. And then there's most of them have like a match percent. And that's just an algorithm. That's just, it's exactly like, here's the posting that I load into the system. And here's all the resumes that were loaded into the system. And it just does this little matching algorithm and it ranks. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, and, and the other question is, you know how some, some ATS system says attach your cover letter uh, as an attachment, yeah. attach your resume as an attachment. Um, what happens if we attach it all as a one document under resume? Like, does that impact it or not really? I so instead of separate documents, we put it all under one and then we just attach it to one. I would say if it's looking for it as two documents to do it as two documents only because it's going to, when it, when it takes your resume, I mean, it, so it does two things. So it takes your resume and it parses out all of those terms and does little matching algorithm. And then it also takes that image and that's an image that the HR person can see. So I see a profile that it creates. I see where you are in the matching queue. And then if I click on you, I can, I can actually see your exact resume. So like the real document as well. So it's doing a couple of different things. So if it's asking for it separately, you might want to attach it separately rather than putting it all into one. I'm just thinking if, if, if you're putting the cover letter and the resume 
in the same attachment. I just don't know what that'll do when it converts it to try and match. Cause there's going to be a whole lot, b- bunch of other types of words in there. I don't know if that would be helpful or not. Oh, so you're saying like when they want it separate, there's a, I would do it separate. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. I would do it separate. If they're, I, I, that's, I always default to that. If they're, if it's asking for something separately, do it separate. If they're asking for it as a word document, do it as a word document. If they ask for it as a PDF, put it in PDF. Like I make sure you're just following what they're asking for. There's a reason why they're asking for it. So I would just follow those instructions as specifically as you can, because there probably is a reason. One more question. Um, I received an email for rejection after interview with HR. Can I request for feedback? Should I email the request or just call the HR person for feedback? I think you can, you can always ask for feedback. Um, They may not respond, unfortunately, but you can always ask. Um, I I tend to think that email is probably better because HR gets a lot of phone calls. So if it's the HR person specifically, I would say you might want to send it in an email just to say, appreciate the time you took to interview me. I received your correspondence indicating that you picked a different candidate. Just wondering if you have five minutes that you could provide some feedback either in writing or if we could have a quick phone call, you know, and just indicate to them, it would be very helpful for me as I continue my job search, like something like that. That's just very factual, very brief. You don't want a lot of their time. You just want a bit of their time. And the purpose that you want it is because you're continuing a job search and it might be helpful to you. So I think I would, I would do that, but the truth is they may not, they may not give you feedback. You can always ask. I mean, I've certainly done it myself, you know, when I, wanted a job and didn't get a job. I mean, it happens, but you want to know why. So I ask it's easier when there's an agency or a search firm involved is my experience. So if, if it's a headhunter or an agency, sometimes the HR person will give them a little bit of feedback that they wouldn't give directly to the candidate. And then you can still get it through the headhunter or the agency. So when they're involved, it can be a lot easier to get that feedback when they're not involved going directly, the HR person might not be comfortable going directly to the person with feedback. Just depends on who you get. I'm sorry, it was me who posted the question. The thing is because I had an interview with an HR person and uh, I was scheduled for the interview and then she last night she canceled saying that the, the hiring manager had a em- family emergency so had to uh, uh, reschedule the interview. Mm-hmm. And then I waited for 10 days later, I follow up and I got a rejection today and say that, oh, they have, go forward with another candidate and I was kind of disappointed yeah but, uh but I, I felt like you know and there was no discussion between me and the hiring manager and the the job description I didn't know but uh this HR person was very nice to put my um resume across to the uh, hiring manager because I before that I applied for an accountant position but this mm-hmm. position was just an associate position. I knew I'm overqualified for that, but I had a so-called virtual interview or yep. Zoom interview with the HR person, and she was willing to put me across to the hiring manager. So, and then she came back to me right away and said, "Yes, uh, the hiring manager is going to meet with me." But then uh, the next then when on the very day of the interview, the reason given was the hiring manager has a family emergency, so had to call off the interview. And then and that that I got this uh, rejection ten days later with uh you know saying that they going forward with other candidates so i'm not sure like i'm proud of that they give give that as an excuse or but on the other hand i kind of puzzle that hr person was really kind to you know put me um you know put me forward for the uh, for the associate position um so well i mean if you if you had a conversation with that hr person and you felt that it went well and you feel that mm-hmm. you have some rapport with that person you might want to contact them again and just say look i you know i received this letter and i understand and you know that's fine obviously mm-hmm. they they selected someone else mm-hmm. but you may just want to try and continue a relationship with that person to yeah. say look if another role comes up that you feel I would be appropriate for, I would really appreciate you passing me along. You may want to ask about the fact that they had an emergency, you were told that it would be rescheduled, but then it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Just to see what the response is on that. You know, if they're willing to talk to you about it, I mean, you never know. Sometimes people just don't call back or they don't respond. But if they are willing to respond, if you do have a rapport with them, you might just want to ask about that and just say, look, I was a little disappointed because, you know, there was this emergency, which I understand Mm -hmm. that happens. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was told that we'd be rescheduling and then we didn't. 
And then I got this rejection letter and I just yeah. I want to know a little bit more about that. Was it, was there something that occurred that I'm not aware of? Would I still be eligible to apply to other roles? Like, would you be comfortable, you know, putting me into, you know, a process for other roles? Mm-hmm. Or keeping you posted of other positions. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you have a rapport and you feel that they would, that they would have a conversation, I think it's worth having a conversation in mm-hmm. that situation. So do you think it, I should, was I a bit strange. Think- Sorry, sorry for interrupting. So you think I should give her a call instead of sending an email to thank her and ask for five minutes of her feedback? You might want to send the email first. Okay. Emails okay. often get a better reply because the person isn't caught off guard. Mm-hmm. So they have a little bit of time to kind of think about how they want to reply. Mm-hmm. I do find that sometimes phone calls, either they don't answer mm-hmm. or they don't give you as good of information because they don't have sort of that time to process how they want to reply or the feedback. You know, if you you have someone off guard asking for feedback, they kind of have to think about it, you know, right off the top of their head and it's not as good quality. You might want to give them an email and then they can think about it. Okay. So I can actually put an email request for five minutes of, uh, um, you know, just uh, feedback. I don't think it hurts. I don't think it hurts. I mean, it's all what you're comfortable with. If you're Mm -hmm. comfortable doing that because you feel that you had a rapport with that person, then there's no harm in doing that. I, th- I thought I did have a rapport with her because she was very prompt with the answering. Like when I first applied, she said, oh, that position has been closed. And then there's a, uh, another position coming up, uh, which we have not posted. And would you like me to put your cross? I said, yes. And then, you know, mm-hmm. at the next minute, I realized that, you know, she gave me an interview. We had a, 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 a Zoom interview with her and I met her for the first time. She said, okay, I'm going to put you to an Indian hire. And then I got objection after the 10 days, which is why I kind of passed over. Like, yeah. Why? Yeah. Well, if you have a good rapport and you're comfortable, then I think that you should. I mean, that's what it comes down to with a lot of this. You have to sort of, they may not reply. So you have to sort of go into it knowing that they may not respond to you. But okay. if it's if it's important to you yeah. to try, then yeah. you should. And these actually came right from recruit. So these, these um, came from people that I know. So network of HR people and recruiters, I know lots of them. So I did the gut check to be sure like, these do's and don'ts are these real the real do's and don'ts or do you want me to add different ones so i actually went to hr people and got these um so they are very recent and very legit so on the do side do make the recruiter's job easy and this is where that profile comes in summarize your skills be very specific to the role make sure that it's just make it easy for that hr person to say yep they've got what i want here's the yes pile so make it simple List your accomplishments in each role, not just the tasks. And that gets back to the, you know, how you build those bullet points and talk about your responsibilities. Make sure you're talking about the accomplishment side of it, not just the task you did. Um, Provide a short description of the company. This is important and not everyone does this. Um, When, and it was actually in one of my slides. So if I say that I currently work for Amazon, we can, we all kind of know what Amazon does. Everybody knows what Amazon does. But there's lots of companies that people don't know what they do. There's so many companies out there. So the HR person, it's actually really handy for the HR person or the hiring manager to see a little like two sentence description of like, what does that company do? So that I know, is it a similar field? Is it different? Is, you know, what is this company all about? And then I can assess you better as a candidate. And when you're listing your employment, just listing month and year is fine. You don't have to get more specific than that, but listing just the month and the year is is sufficient when you're looking at experience. Um, Provide a reliable and appropriate means of contacting you. So make sure that you list your phone number, your mobile phone, if in fact the mobile is the best way to get in touch with you and make sure if you're going to list it, Listen to your voicemail on your mobile, make sure it's professional, make sure it's what you want a recruiter or an HR person or a hiring manager to hear. So it's just a little thing, but it's an important thing. Same with email. So if you're going to list your email as one of the means of contacting you, make sure it's a professional email address. I cannot tell you how many completely unprofessional and offensive email handles that I've seen on resumes. And I've had to call the person and say, this is like, you should not have this. Just come up with a different email because this is not professional. It's whatever their personal one is, but just make sure it's professional. So if if you're going to list it, make sure it's professional. If you're going to put your phone number, make sure you have a voicemail on it or something professional on it so that people can leave a message for you. Um, adjust your goals and objectives to reflect the role. So if you're going to list goals and objectives and profiles and summaries and all these things on your resume that, that grab the attention of the hiring manager or HR person, make sure that it's very reflective of the role you're applying to. 
HR people get a lot of resumes that say, my objective is to get a part-time marketing job and they're applying to a full-time product manager job. Make sure you've changed it. If you're going to be that specific on your resume or your cover letter, make sure you change all of those, the next job that you're applying to. I mean, we know that you're probably using the same resume or cover letter as your template and you're just changing certain things. So make sure you change it. Make sure that you don't miss that. Um, and then talk about somewhere in your cover letter or in your resume, talk about how you worked with your colleagues in different departments. This is really, really important, especially right now in a virtual world. We need to know that you can interact with different levels in the organization and different departments in the organization seamlessly. We need to know that you've done it before, that you're comfortable you know, dealing with all different people in all different departments. So if you've done that as part of your work experience, make sure you say that. So things that recruiters don't love to see. Don't use lots of different fonts. Don't use too much bold, italics, graphics. Sometimes people get a little creative and they just use lots of these things and it can just be very visually distracting. So just pick like a few things that you want to put in bold or italic if, if you're gonna use it at all, use it sparingly. Um, don't use lots of sentences to describe one bullet point. So if there's really just one thing you're talking about, don't really elaborate to you know the nth degree on each of those things try to be succinct there is value in being concise and succinct it does show that you have good um, communication skills your ability to do that so try not to use the loss of senses to describe one thing um, be careful about being kind of cheeky or kind of jokey or conceited we sometimes see resumes where people, like it looks like they have single-handedly been responsible for the success of an entire organization. It is great to be confident. It is great to talk about your accomplishments, but do it with a degree of humility. <laughs> Don't be too sort of cheeky. And we do see people trying to be kind of jokey and be careful about that because it doesn't always come across well, right? It's, it's in writing. So it, the person reading it might not get what you're saying, so just try to be careful about humor and, and, you know, patting yourself on the back. Just be careful about how you do it so that it comes across well. Be careful about buzzwords and cliches. Um, and these are just all these, you know, things that we hear all the time, like building synergies on teams and gosh, there's so many buzzwords and cliches, but just team player, you know, things like that. Be careful about them. Use them if they're appropriate, but be careful about overuse of buzzwords and, and cliche type statements. Just try to be very real on your resume. It will get you a lot further. Um, you don't need to use the word I or my on a resume. It's implied. So it's an implied, um, it's implied that you're talking about yourself. So you don't need to use I or my. Sometimes it's tempting because it feels a little funny not to, but you don't need to do that on a resume. Watch your spelling and grammatical errors. This is a big one. It really, really will get you sort of put aside as a candidate if there's spelling and grammatical errors. So use your functions on, you know, word, use your spell check, your grammar check, have someone else read it. It's important to have someone else read it. Sometimes we miss things, right? We're too close to the content. We've read it so many times because ours, you know, get someone else to read it just to be sure that you don't have anything like that. Try to be careful about calling the organization or the HR person multiple times to check on your candidacy. This can be a bother for HR people and for hiring managers, it depends on the organization. It depends on the person. But if it's an HR person who's recruiting for, you know, 15, 20 roles at once, having people phone them is just, it's just unfortunately not practical for them to take all of those phone calls. So following up is fine. Normally that would happen after you've had a phone screen. So really the point at which you get someone's name is normally if they call you for a phone screen or a phone interview. Once that part has happened, following up with them is appropriate at that point, but do it according to what they're telling you. So if they're telling you, I'm going to be screening people for the next two weeks. And after that, you'll probably hear from me. Give them the two weeks that they told you. Don't call them you know, a couple of days later and look for an update because they've already told you that it'll probably be two weeks. So just take the lead from them as to what's appropriate timing. And then try to avoid using multiple or incorrect verb tenses. So this is important. And if you look on, um, I think it was on the examples slide. And again, this is in your handout um, around describing your roles. If you're going to use past tense, use all past tense. If you're going to use present tense, use all present tense. So make sure that you're just being consistent about those verb tenses. It's easy to, to 
forget and it's easy to just sort of write it quickly and not look for that later, but it, it's important. And that's it. I know that there, I know that dress for success has a couple different avenues that they can use for, um, for resume editing. So a couple different professionals actually that do this. Yeah. As Jennifer said, um, in our biweekly client emails, you'll see, um, like a little blurb about resume editing, but on behalf of everyone, there's a lot of thank yous coming in. Thank you so much, Jennifer.